Hello, everybody, and welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact with the, you know, how to make an impact in the world with your art. <laughs> Boy, let's do that again. Let's, we're coming back from Thanksgiving. We're a little <laughs> off our, off our game. Okay, this is the uh, take two. Um, Alex, go ahead and not worry about that first. <laughs> first one. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators. And for the last, oh, 25 years, we work with just about every publisher in the business, and we've published somewhere around 100 books, and we've all taught illustration at universities. That is correct. Each week we're going to come at you guys with a different topic. Sometimes we're going to agree. Sometimes we are going to argue like today, but each time you're going to <laughs> learn what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> or what to do, right? right? Oh yeah, what to do as well. <laughs> okay, so here we are. Uh, we're finishing out the, the year and um, I just, uh, uh, Lee was mentioning that he wanted to talk about or he wanted to read a few of our uh, uh, reviews that we've gotten on iTunes. So I'll just turn the time over to Lee and, and you can take that away. This should be a treat. You should, you should read the bad ones. That's what we're doing. Okay. I'm going to read the top three bad ones. We love when you guys leave reviews and, and we welcome it. We want all feedback. These are the ones that I really enjoy. But we don't reading. want to incentivize bad reviews. So that's true. Oh, this you, is going to be the last time we ever read bad ones. So let's just do a, let's just do a, a public service announcement for reviewing <laughs> things, not just on our podcast, but everywhere. If you like something, that means probably select all the stars. Because sometimes right. people will say, "Hey, this is a great podcast." One star. Yeah, I've gotten that on on my ebooks. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I, saw, I spend way too much time thinking about that kind never of Never understood that. <laughs> and also, if you go to Amazon, don't critique the shipping if you're rating a product. Oh, my gosh. That is <laughs> the, my biggest pet peeve, right, with, with it Amazon. Ch <laughs> it changes the complete review rank ranking of something because you're saying, oh, it didn't get here on time. Well, that's it's not the product. I know. It's like, oh, this product looks good. Let, you know, let me see if I, if I like it. Product's great. One star though, because it it came, uh, you know, the shipping was uh, was horrible. That's a review on Amazon, not a review on the product. Yeah, yeah. They need to have like two separate things for for people. I agree. Yeah, the the execution and then the product itself, for yeah. sure. All right, so here we go. So this one was written. Let's see. This was a while back. This was on January four, almost a year ago. You ready for the review? It says this is short and sweet. These guys clearly don't prepare before a podcast, and it shows. <laughs> <laughs> no, talking about. no more truer statement has ever been. Touche, yeah. fine, sir. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? We spend weeks with relentless preparation. We have a whole team of researchers getting our shows ready so we can be on the mark. <laughs> okay. So here we go. The next review says, that, uh, d "Wait, just a, that was back in in January, almost a year ago. So I would say we've gotten better in that regard. That was before but we I, were. Preparing. I feel like we're a little bit more prepared now. Well, we're learning as we go. I mean, I hope yeah. we're better, you know, than we were a year ago, and yeah. I think we're getting it figured out. I just figured out today that you can plug the computer into the internet connection and get a stronger feed. So." <laughs> <laughs> that's about our technology level um okay so the second one the the header or the little title is had to un had to unsubscribe again two stars mm -hmm. i'm a huge fan of jake's work and advice from youtube and there have been practical tips and interesting discussion interesting discussions occasionally here however too often the topic is lost in limbo or falls off altogether with irrelevant marks personal stories that lumber on <laughs> tangents <laughs> Will. Will Terry. <laughs> Personal experiences can be great to share if they can be summed up and focus on the details. I find when it's not, that really kills the transitions of the topics, and I want to stop listening. I also felt that there was a disconnect between the title of some of them and the content. They're crazy. You know what? You know. You know what I chalk it up to is is we consume content in different ways for different reasons at different times. Mm -hmm and in different environments. So like someone that's might be on the train that's like, I'm looking for at least an hour to kill and I want to feel like I'm hanging out with some guys. Yeah. 
that's exactly. that's kind of who well, what we're kind of bank banking on but the person that's just like wants to take notes and get information really quickly yeah it would be frustrating to have me going off and telling these wonderful stories that are just amazing stories you know <laughs> <laughs> well, i i i'm glad they said that because i i don't want this podcast to be okay here's our points and and we're going to give you a couple of bullet points and be out you know done in five minutes it's not a class Right, it's a right. it's a discussion, and sometimes it evolves into something that we didn't even know it was going to. That's what I that's what I personally like about it. But if you're looking for that, you know, clear tires, you know, five things to do portfolio, and I need them real quick, uh, it's probably not going to be the. The right. other thing, it, uh, it should feel like you 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 know stumbled in off the street into our studio. Here's the three of us. We're working, and and we're like throwing out some ideas around on a topic, and and it's I mean it should it should feel. It should feel like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, the other thing I would I would argue in our defense with the uh, rambling is that the more comfortable we are in our discussion, the easier it is to to think of more anecdotes to go along with it because we're engaged in a fun way. You make right. you make me go boring, and it's just read the bullet points, you know. Right. Done. And I, th I think I think what what the uh, listener gets out of what we do is actually an honest reaction. Like sometimes we don't know we're going to be talking about something, and and now I think all three of us feel comfortable enough to really lay it out there, whether it's good or bad. Yeah. Um, this this is, is this is this is how we talk ourselves into dismissing a bad review. <laughs> hey, the, the, this is a review the reviewer. You don't know what you're talking about, bro. That's what we're trying that's what we're trying for. <laughs> if it looks like we don't care, that's our goal, actually. <laughs> um, and the last one I'll read. I should add that uh, this is out of 500 reviews. These are the only three that are critical. So that's yeah. not, not a bad thing. Um, it says decent content. I love a review that starts like that. That's, a, that's the true internet voice of review, yeah. right? Decent content. I'll give it a five. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but inconsistent show posting is kind of weird for three guys who always talk about the importance of consistency. Now, that was even into last year. That was actually a year ago, November 21. Um, we're a lot better now, so I think that one's been solved. Yeah. I think we have, yeah, in the last year, we have gotten down that like that system where these are every two weeks if not on the the same day at least a day off and uh that's all tanner's fault <laughs> <laughs> think of no. think of us as the the guy i can't remember his, the, the character's name in office space when he comes in to talk to the two bobs you know, and he walks in in his slippers and he goes and pours himself a cup of water and he's going to have this interview to save his job. And he's like, I don't even care. Do what you want. That's kind of who we are. We're like, <laughs> just, we're just we've gotten a lot better. Like our audio has gotten better over the last year. Our posting consistency is a lot better. And yeah. um, I think now we're getting into really interesting. I think originally it was interesting topics, but I think we're really figuring out what we mm -hmm. want out of the podcast. So I think it's better. Right. And all kidding aside, like the work that the Tanner does, the work that Alex does, the work that Aaron does to get these things like posted on YouTube, posted on all the different uh, podcasting services and just the editing. Like, I think, uh, I think we're in a good spot right now. It only took us 40 episodes to, <laughs> to figure it out. No, I think we've been, we've been on this good clip for like the last 20 episodes probably. So I think we're good. All right, enough of patting our own back. Let's, awesome. <laughs> let's do today's topic. Okay. Is it, is it going to be Will? It's Will's today, yep, right? It's Will's oh, today. Oh, it's mine? Take oh. it away, Will. Oh, uh, let me think real quick. What should we do? Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh shoot. You, you haven't prepared? <laughs> All right, so I got, this, I got this letter from Joel, and I actually got permission to use his name and to read his letter. The interesting thing about this is we're going to actually answer his question at the end. So I'm going to, I'm not going to read his question at the end, but I'm just going to say his, this podcast was inspired by his letter um, that he sent to SVS learn info at gmail.com, which is our kind of our company in, info thing that Mia gets. Mia is our customer support person. And uh, the topic is on, um, reps and agents, artist reps and agents, and is it worth it to have an artist rep or an agent? 
And his question is a little more, is quite a bit more specific. And so, but I thought that it would work better in at the end. So what I wanted to do is really explore this topic. We had explored this when we were doing third Thursday broadcasts on YouTube uh, a couple of years ago, and we haven't done it for the podcast. And so I thought we can't, this is a really important topic to discuss. So we're just going to dive right in. And I'm going to ask you guys some questions and you're going to give really good answers and we're going to have a discussion and then we're going to get to his question. So the first one is what's the difference between a rep and an agent? Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll start us off. Okay. <laughs> Lee's got that deer in the headlights look. I don't know. I don't know that I know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, for those listening, you can, if you want to see Lee's deer in the headlights look, you can check us out on YouTube on our YouTube channel, which one of you probably knows what our YouTube channel is. Is it SVS Learn something YouTube? I should know that. Right. See, right, didn't, right. didn't prepare. I'm going to look for it. But go ahead, Jake. Hold rep on, Googling agent. reps, agents. <laughs> <and others. laughs> Here comes a Wikipedia answer from Jake. <laughs> no, in, in my understanding, I've, so um, a rep is a person who is basically trying to fill jobs uh, for uh, for publishers who just need an artist for something or anything like we we need an illustrator to uh, to do this book we need an illustrator to do this book cover uh, this editorial piece something like that and so they're they're just um, they're just out there trying to to get jobs uh, specific one-off jobs for uh, for their illustrators um, an agent I believe is a little bit more holistic now typically an agent is is someone who is looking for um, uh, uh, jobs where you could either write the book yourself um, uh, create you know have more of a, a, a creator uh, owned component to the project that you're on and I think an agent is more com uh, concerned with your overall career trajectory than um, specifically like handing off handing off jobs to you. Um, and in that sense, you also have managers. And I don't know, there's too many art managers out there. Uh, usually a manager is something that you'd see in um, Hollywood with writers and actors and, and things like that. And, and what they what they might do is look at <clears throat> everything you're doing as a in your career as an artist. <clears throat> Excuse me. And and they make sure that what you're doing over here on the left side uh, is, you know, is, um, you know, doesn't interfere with what you're doing on the right side and maybe even helps, helps both those things out. So, um, but I, I think for, for the purposes of this, an agent is somebody that, that you're going to want to work with to help you get like book deals and, and specifically they're called literary agents. And so they can, they can represent artists, they can represent illustrators, and they can represent the artist illustrator. So the person who has story ideas and the person who does the illustrations for those story ideas. I don't know, does that sound good? No, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I, get, I think there's some nuance there though that I think you, I think you grouped two together that shouldn't be together, and then there's two that should be split up. The, the literary rep, in my understanding, and I could be wrong here, but literary rep is solely focused on author illustrator and in, in other words i don't think that if you're just somebody who's an illustrator who just does work for other writers that you will be able to sign with a literary rep i do not think that would be part of their who they want as their um in their stable i agree i agree if i yeah if, if that if i came across saying up other than that then then i was wrong yeah, I mean, you, uh, I think how you described it, at least what I heard was, if you're into publishing, a literary rep might, rep might be the person, but I think the literary rep is for if you want to write and illustrate, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. just write. I mean, I've seen some illustrators who have gone, uh, signed on to a literary rep, and then sometimes they just write. They actually don't illustrate the story. Um, so literary agent's going to be more writing focused. Um, but I have a question about the, about the rep um, agent difference because I I've just assumed those were sort of the same thing but I understand what Jake was saying that one person's kind of a career guide and and looking out for the whole thing and the other one's more of a service thing basically trying to get you 
uh, you know, as much work wherever it will come from. And I think, but, uh, but my understanding of it, that was there's certain agents using that as a broad term just sort of do that. Like my first agent, that's exactly what they did, but they were con still considered an agent, not a rep. Let me sort you guys out. Let, let me sort you guys out a little bit there. So you good, good stab at it. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Here, historically, and you guys are right, but historically, um, the only part that I didn't agree with Jake was the, the, the rep doesn't handle your career. Historically, uh, illustrators, famous illustrators were solely managed by their, their artist representatives and they did manage their whole career. And we're talking about, you know, advertising artists or artists that did, you know, high end editorial work, uh, which weren't, didn't have anything to do with, with publishing as far as like writing. And there were some really, there were reps that were kind of celebrities in the business um, who really prided themselves on like Richard Solomon. Who really exactly prided, what I was thinking of. Yeah, really prided themselves. I mean, they handled artists like Gary Kelly and and Chris Payne and and, and stuff like that. And and um, uh, you know, they only had maybe ten or fifteen artists in their stable, and and their whole primary job was to find work for those artists. And and so basically, if you're if you're listening to this and you're like, what are they even talking about? You, as as an art as an illustrator, you have a choice of either going it alone and managing your own prospecting for clients, or you can, um, you can hire an agent or an artist rep that will, um, you know, look for work and you can offload that task to them and they charge a percentage. They take a percentage of the, the, um, jobs that you do, the assignments. And that's basically what we're going to be talking about today. So you guys are right. Um, and, and it's really shifted. So like right now, um, I feel like the, the heyday of the rep is over. I feel like the, there was a peak, you know, maybe, I don't know, as many as 20 or 30 years ago, where artist reps really were, you really couldn't make it as an illustrator without one. Mm -hmm. I feel like with the internet today, you can live without a rep uh, a lot easier than you, you could. Agents, on the other hand, I feel like if you're if you're wanting to write um, and illustrate or just write, I think you're kind of silly to do it on your own. Mm -hmm. But but I would love for you guys to expound on that. But I but the reason I think so is because um, that publishers rely on agents to do a lot of the the uh, the reading, the sifting of manuscripts, and the and the uh, publishers will you know, call up an agent and say, what do you have in the form of, let's say in this genre over here of, you know, it's a, it's, it's geared towards girls age 10 and it's dealing with the subject matter of, um, of bullying or something like that, you know, at school. Yeah. And, and do you have any manuscripts that, that cover that? And they might call different agents and, and cattle call in a bunch of manuscripts and, and look at them. And so the agents are the first ones with first eyes on those manuscripts and the agents obviously aren't going to manage you if you are not writing good stories. So it saves time for the publisher to use the agent. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think you're. I think you're right. I think I think that the agent's role and responsibility has changed over time. And I think I think now well, I'll go back to like using Richard Solomon as as an example. He was a he was a rep and still is a rep. They're still active, right? I, I believe so. Check. Um, but they repped the highest end of illustration, in, especially in the mid-90s and, and, and early 2000s. Uh, and I think they're still, they're still doing that. Um, but one of the things that I remember specifically that they did was a, they kind of grouped all their illustrators together and they started pitching them as mural artists uh, that would, would go, would basically decorate interior walls of businesses that would be huge. And I think of the one I think of specifically is Gary Kelly doing the inside of Barnes and Noble. And it was a, I mean, it must've been 200 feet wide and he's not painting it there on site. He's paint, he's, you know, doing a smaller illustration and then they print that and it just lines the entire bookstore. And it was gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I mean, just gorgeous work, but he did that for everybody like banks and, you know, his whole stable of illustrators were doing these murals, or at least most of them were. Mm -hmm. And I see that as being the, best case scenario that an agent sees a 
unfilled market gap mm -hmm. and fills it with his with his artists like that's an ideal thing i don't think that happens as much anymore but i do think that what will's talking about does happen is that the clients don't have the patience or the time to to look through every single thing that's submitted from amateurs so they do look to the rep to kind of use that as a kind of a gatekeeper and say hey mm -hmm. like will said what do you got of it that's available in this genre or whatever the style and then you get a small group of things going to them and then they pick from that and there's other jobs that never ma make it to the marketplace i remember i did a campaign for united airlines a long time ago that would it was never advertised there's no getting that if you weren't repped and uh mm -hmm. you know some people are like oh i don't want to give the agent you know, at that point I was with just an illustrator agent and they took 25%, which I'm sure we're going to talk about in a little bit, but I would have never got that job and the pay scale was insane for that as opposed to the jobs I'm getting on my own before the mm -hmm. agent. So I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Um, I might want, but before you, Jake, I'm just going to insert this, that um, our YouTube channel is, is uh, under society of visual storytelling. So if you type that in, and the later episodes that have been uploaded have our video webcams. Yeah, we the early ones that. didn't, we didn't record. So anyway, just throwing that out there. Go ahead, Jake. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say like, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're looking for, um, you know, just one off illustration work, having a, a good website, you know, easy to contact you, a good social media presence, um, that's going to go a long way for art directors who are just out there like kind of looking for stuff. If you're, you know, if you have a, something on Behance or ArtStation or uh, I don't know if art directors are searching DeviantArt, but you could, DeviantArt's actually getting an overhaul. It's a lot better um, place to host your art now. Hmm. But um, if you have sort of a, a presence out there, you'll, uh, and, and, and you yourself want to um, make your own list of art directors, uh, whether it's through LinkedIn or, or just, you know, going to individual publishers and looking, you know, who, who works for who. <clears throat> Chances are you might, you might be able to uh, get enough work, enough jobs to sustain yourself. Um, mm -hmm. However, that is in itself like a job <laughs> that you have to do. Like that's part of your job. So it's, you know, how many hours a day are you going to spend, you know, networking and going out there and trying to, to find the right people and, and land the right jobs. Um, and so I think what, what a rep is going to do for you is, is they can sort of, um, you know, they're, they're already in touch with the right people they're going to sort of uh, grease the wheels a little bit for you there in that um, they might know the right person to fit the right job and you might be that person, right? So, so it, <clears throat> I think it comes down to how much work you want to do as an artist or uh, administrative work, I guess you want to do outside of your art. The other thing though is with, the, with an agent, if you're wanting to get illustration work for books, um, and I, and I think, I think here's, here's really the, the difference there is, um, agents are making deals where you are going to have some sort of back end, um, royalty off of the work that you're doing. Right. So that's any sort of a book publication where you're doing, you know, you're doing the illustrations and your name is on the cover or on the spine of that, of that book. Um, when you do a book cover, you usually get a, um, you know, one-off fee and you don't get, you know, if that book goes on to sell a million copies, you don't get any extra, um, any extra pay for that. Uh, but if, if you have an agent and, and they're able to um, somehow f connect you to the right creator, to the right publisher or the right project, they're able to get you, um, I guess, better more substantial deals and understand the, the the landscape of the publishing world a little bit better. So they know where you fit. They know who to take you to. They know, uh, they know which editor has just left this publishing house and is moving to this house and is looking for new artists. And, and they know all these kind of things that are happening um, to help get you those, those book deals that are going to get you royalties in the future, but also, a bigger advance up front as well. So I think that's the difference. And, and I've known artists who, um, 
who've had agents and they've had reps and they have, you know, after five, 10 years of working in the industry and, and getting to know so many different people, they were able to say, you know what, I, I think I can handle this on my own. I know how to do a contract. I know how to, <coughs> who to talk to. I know, I know what's out there and, and they're able to, they're able to do that. Now, granted those people that I know that have done that also live in these major metropolitan areas where the publishers are. So mm. they live in New York. So it's easy for them to go get drinks with, you know, an art director and editor and, and just kind of talk about the industry and who's doing what and, and where things are happening. Um, for me, I live in Arizona. Um, I, I don't really touch base with anybody in publishing uh, in person at all. And so I really do rely on my agent to help me basically to, to sort of figure out a plan for, for me and who to talk to and what to do. Whereas I'd, I'd be, I, there's no way I could, you know, understand exactly where to go and what to do next with, uh, with the next illustration job. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, okay. How, if you guys were trying to find a rep today, how would you do that? Let's say you're just out of school, you're rearing to go. Uh, how would you go about it, or or would you? I I would. I guess I guess one thing to be wary of. I guess this will go to the to the illustrator who's exactly in the boat you're talking about hasn't been rep before. Sometimes I think people who haven't had an agent before think that it's sort of the magic bullet. Like, I, I'm, this is hard for me. I don't have any connections. If I just had the connections, it would all land in place. Not realizing that it, it really is a true partnership and you have to keep feeding that agent new work that there's a big responsibility on it. It's not like everything falls on the agent once you get signed and all of a sudden you're just free to draw all day. Um, there's, a, there's just a lot of work you still have to do. And so I just don't want to give people the impression that if, if, if you got an agent that all your problems would be solved. Um, so it really is a, a, a partnership kind of thing. Um, my question to you guys before we answer how would you get one is, is since you made the distinction between a rep and an agent, I still view those as the same thing. If you, if you wanted one or the other, would you Google something different or would you, would you research something different for each one? Because I see that as being the same search. It's, it's not though. Because if you, well, if, you, if you're not writing and you search for an agent, you're going to, you're going to find people that are going to be asking you for your manuscripts. Well, that's just a literary agent. So there's a difference there, but but the difference, so the difference between an agent and a literary agent is solid. And you know what, maybe, maybe, um, and I haven't actually done this, but maybe reps like Tammy Shannon are using keywords agent in there as well. So you might pull them up. I'm not sure, but I would, I would advise people that if you're not writing, go ahead and Google artist rep those, those keywords, illustrator rep, artist rep, and you'll bring up, um, you'll definitely bring up people like Tammy Shannon, who's mostly when that's, and so what's funny about her is that organization and they're one of the biggest is both. So they, they represent people who only uh, do the art, only do the illustration. And they also represent people who do the art and, or who are writing and submitting manuscripts. From what I understand, they don't, represent people who are just writing. So you have to be, but then there are agents who only represent people who are writing. There aren't agents to my knowledge that only represent people who are doing just the art. So that's where the, the terminology kind of. I think Shannon associates started that way. I think they would be open to it. Like, Hey, here's a manuscript. Okay. They've got those connections too, but I think they're primarily an art agent without the writing side being attached to it. And it's, thing, it's possible that they are representing people who are just writing. I don't think they are. But I, don't I think mean, that, are that would be a surprise to me. But one thing that is an important distinction for the person who is writing and illustrating is you probably want to look for a literary agent. And the difference is significant because they all of them have the same contacts, whether it's an artist agent or, or literary agent or whatever. But the percentage that they take is much different for some reason. The illustrator agent can take between 25 and 35% now, 35 being the highest one I've heard. Uh, but the literary agent only takes 15%. And yet, with an, if you're an artist illustrator, you get a much better, bigger and better budget and royalty structure. 
So the financial side of it, everything is better with Writer Illustrator, except for the one caveat there is you might get more uh, lucrative jobs and more um, pace, quicker jobs from an artist agent. So that's the one thing to weigh. And historically, the reason that that is the way it is, is because prior to the internet, artist reps had to spend more money making uh, portfolios for their illustrators and actually physically mailing them out, uh, mailing portfolios around the country, around the world even. And I used to do that. And my rep would say, I need you to send it here and bill me and then blah, blah, blah. And then they right. pass that on to the client. So there was more um, actual work and more costs involved in getting artwork out than emailing a manuscript, you know? True. Um, and so that's where that price discrepancy, but you're right. Reps almost uh, it used to be 25% was standard and now it's like 30 or 35. It's crazy. Which is, yeah, it's a lot of money to give up to, to, to a representative. And, and yet, yeah, so literary agents historically have been 10 to 15%. Yep. A lot better. But the, the, your payment is so few and far between as well. If you're writing stories, you might do one story a year. Whereas right. with an artist agent, you can get, you know, a couple of advertising jobs, maybe an editorial job. The one problem that I ran into with an artist agent versus a literary agent is they were sort of fielding everything to me. I, I felt like it wasn't guiding my career specifically. It was, hey, here's, we got a toy company who wants a box illustration. You want, you know, do you want it? And, and, and all this different stuff that I had no you know, I had no hand in, I, I, and it, I had no rights to it. Typically the fees were a lot lower mm -hmm. and it was almost just like, they're just doing a volume grab. Like whoever, whoever wants to illustrate this can illustrate it. We just want somebody to illustrate it. And they're, I think they were sending it to multiple artists too within the um, umbrella of their company. But I just felt like if you ended up doing all the work that was sent to you without really carefully evaluating it, pretty soon you're do, you have a ton of work that you did and none of it is actually portfolio quality or pushing you in a direction that you wanted to go. Right. So back to my original question, how do you get one? Oh, oh yeah. That, <laughs> see, these guys meander in there. <laughs> it's totally true. There's no way to stay on track here. <laughs> <laughs> how do you get one? Uh, first step would be, I think, asking around your, your, your small circles, your SCBWI, crit groups, any kind of personal recommendation is going to be so, is going to be weighed so much heavier than a cold call. So mm -hmm. that would be my mm -hmm. first step. You mean like if you if you're at a um, at a conference or something, ask your friends or people that you meet, like yeah, just in your inner circle. You know, if you're posting to forums and you know those people, hey, who's rep by who, and have you had a good experience, and and would you mind if I, some, you know, you want to be careful there about giving too many recommendations. Be careful about that. Um, but yeah, just start asking you asking people that are in your both online circle, Facebook groups and stuff like that. And just see what people's experiences are. And uh, somebody might give you a recommendation. Hey, my agent's looking for uh, more artists or this person's branched out on their own and is looking for artists. And I just think a personal recommendation always goes farther than anything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's good. Um, uh, well, the other thing is to build your network a little bit, uh, broaden that out a little bit as well too. So maybe you have five or 10 artists you really look up to who might be, you know, five, 10 years ahead of you. I would just reach out to them and just say, Hey, I really like your work. I really like what you did here with this book. I really like, you know, this illustration, how you did the lighting here, oh, compliment them, do whatever. Um, ask them who reps them. And if you could uh, either have contact info or, um, Go to the website once you once you understand you know the the who their agent is or or, or who's repping them. Um, uh, find out whatever website that they that they have and find out the contact information there or the submission process there. Um, especially if you feel like your illustration style or your storytelling style matches um, some of these artists that you you are already like looking up to and 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 following uh, because. Uh, it might be that these illustrator or these these agents, um, uh, you know, already know how to sell that kind of work. Already know who who to connect to with that style of work, right? So I like to do comics. I've done comics in the past, and I I do very um, representative I uh, style illustration. I guess I I mean it leans stylized, but it is 
you know, there's strong line work and, 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 and you can see a, a specific style there. And it's very different from what Lee does and it's different from what Will does. Um, Will's hyper rendered. Lee is uh, much more um, textured and, uh, and <laughs> clumsy, uh, clumsy. You know, he, 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 redraw, he redraws his lines if they're too good. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but, uh, but the difference, the difference there is, is the agent that, that is working with Lee probably knows what to do with someone who also illustrates like Lee does and, um, and might not know exactly what to do with me. That said, that may be like, you know, <laughs> I'm sure an agent knows what to do with with a uh, with a broad range. So what I would do is just just go find out, go to these websites, go on LinkedIn, go on um, uh, you know just do a Google search and find out who is uh, who's a, who is an agent and look at their submission policies. Look at you know what they need, what they look for. Um, find some sort of contact information and just start reaching out. That would be outside of going through your network. But I think too, like making friends with, um, with the illustrators that you look up to is a good way to sort of um, find your way into this. And that's, that's personally how I got my agent was making friends with a group of illustrators. Um, and then an agent that worked with one of these other illustration illustrators contacted me because they liked the work that I was doing and they, and they were familiar with, uh, the work that I was doing because I was associated with somebody they were already representing. Mm -hmm. How'd you get your agent, Will? Do you, are you agented right now or do you not have an agent? I am. I'm with uh, Illazoo. Okay. Uh, how'd, you, how'd you get that? Uh, they found me online. Um, and I, th I actually think that's the best way is, is if the, if the rapper agent finds you online and cause then, you know, they're, it's, it's like, it's, it's, it's similar to asking someone out. If, if you're the one that's being asked out on a date, you, it puts you in the power position. Whereas if you're the one asking, it puts you in the, the lower power position, right? Yeah. Wouldn't you say? And For sure. That's why the recommendation, the personal recommendation is always going to be better because that's sort of like right. everybody's on neutral ground. Right. The first agent that I, or the first rep that I had was Tammy or uh, Joanne Shuna. <clears throat> and I... I just at random, this was back in the day before the internet and, you know, dinosaur land and all that. And, and I found 10 reps and I thought, I, th I think I'm ready for a rep. And I put 10 of them on my mailing list. I was mailing postcards regularly to prospect for new clients. And I was just sending out, you know, at one point I was sending 4,000 postcards every two or three months out, you know, mm -hmm. and I put 10 of them on my list. I think when I had 500 or a thousand people on my mailing list, and I think I mailed to them five or six times. And then I got a, I got a call from a rep that didn't pan out. It didn't sound right for various reasons. It just, it, she was brand new and she hadn't really, she was just starting. And I just thought, I don't really want to lock myself into someone who's just starting out. And then like a week or two later or a month later, I got a call from Joanne Shuna, who was a great rep at the time. And, uh, just a great person. And she, we were together for like over a decade easily. And she got a lot of work for me. So I was just mailing a postcard, just, you know, saying, and I was the one asking, I was, you know, in the, the lesser position. And then when I was with Tammy, Tammy Shannon and associates, uh, they, she saw me online. She saw me in the workbook and showcase, which are source books that don't really exist anymore. And she contacted me and asked, and I couldn't at the time because I was locked down with Joanne Shuna. I was exclusive with her. So I turned her down. And then when uh, Joanne's business started to wane a little bit because of the internet, and I felt like I needed more representation, I contacted Tammy and she acted like she didn't know who I was <laughs> <Burn>. <laughs> and put me in the, in the, 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 you know, the, the lower power position. And it, it worked out great. So they were great for me. Um, had a little falling out later that I, I don't really talk about that much. But uh, Oh, you shouldn't have said that. Let's hear it. <laughs> well, Let's no, 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 I'm, no. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. No, you know what? In the end, uh, and that's the thing is like I could be the, the, the jilted lover that's like, they suck. But, in, it, you know, they got me a ton of work. They, what they did do, they did really well. 
and the problem that we had was not related to getting work. So, and it's, you know, and it's, it's something that's touchy for them and for me and it's better to just, I, I like the idea of just kind of letting it rest. Yeah. There, you know? And then, you know, I should add that there's different, there's different agents for different times of your career. I, I don't see it anymore uh -huh. as, as somebody holding the same agent for their entire career. I was also with Shannon Associates um, for a number of years and, and, and that was, it couldn't have been a better fit for where right. I was. I right. hadn't locked down on my process of painting. I hadn't locked down on my style, especially since I was so new to it. Um, I was going through still big artistic changes right there in the beginning. And Shannon Associates was fantastic for that. I, I got a wide variety of work. I got to see if I liked doing s some stuff and I thought I would and I didn't and other things I didn't think I'd like and I did. Um, so it was a real testing ground kind of, and we got to play with a wide variety of stuff and looks and, and, some interesting things too came from that that didn't, hasn't come from other agents that I've had since then. They, mm -hmm. they had like a couple of big commercial jobs where they said, Hey, do you want to go for this? Here's the look like they, like you have to do a painting in this other style, like this, this exact look like somebody mm -hmm. else had already done the work. And, mm -hmm. um, and you know, I've like, I've never done that before I tried. I never got any of those jobs because it always ended up looking like my, my work. I wasn't very good at it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but it was interesting to try it. I wouldn't have, wouldn't have thought of that. Um, eventually what what the good part of that agent was became actually why i left because i started saying okay i've tried all this stuff but here's kind of what i want to do mm -hmm. and then that mm -hmm. became more specific i want to start writing and so i switched from an artist agent to a literary rep at that point and still um, followed that road yeah yeah so basically getting getting the rep is you can get them in in different ways or the agent um you can email them with your, your information and, and with uh, some, some of your work, or you could send them, you could mail to them. I, I particularly think that mailing something to them is going to get more attention than emailing because everyone's insulated with their yeah. email. Mm -hmm. So if you're really wanting to get a rep or an agent, I would, I would put a package together and, and maybe even, you know, do it three or four times because it it's hard to get people's attention. Um, and six and, times is, is the kind of general rule of thumb for advertising that six exposures to someone is the time where they start saying, Oh yeah, there's that person. Who yeah. Did that. Yep. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do just one. Don't, don't put everything into one package. And then if nothing happens, be like, Oh, I guess I'm a failure because it really does take repeated. Like Will was saying, he had that big list. He's mailing, you know, three, 4,000 postcards every so often. And like that really does make a difference over, over time. It's not just yeah. one, the silver bullet. Yep. idea yeah. i should add too. get some confirmation if you are in this boat where you're thinking about getting a rep or trying to get one get some confirmation that you are ready to send your work out there i think i think mm -hmm. it's a mistake to be there too early uh and that can hurt you worse than help you or don't look for the agent to kind of point you in the right direction you yeah. should know where you want to go yeah i think that's right yeah. have you guys ever known um people to get agents or reps and then not get any work from them Yes, I've had I've had a couple of, of our students actually that that were wrapped and then don't know what to do after it sort of didn't yield anything or the agent. There's there's a couple of stories I've heard where agents will uh, they're kind of acting as a gatekeeper of the work, so they write a manuscript and they never let it out. They keep asking for revisions and revisions and revisions, revisions and they haven't even submitted it to a client. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, and so that can be confusing. I've got a couple of emails like that where I walk somebody through leaving an agent. Right. Mm -hmm. How about you, Jake? Uh, I I have heard of people where it's it it has sort of run dry a little bit. Um, you know, they have to constantly like contact them and and remind them like, hey, here I am. Uh, you know, I'm available. What do you need? And and at that point, I think it's time to find someone who's a little bit more invested in in you as a creator and and. You know, there's there's pl there's so many out there. You could find someone that's really into your stuff and wants to wants to like help you out and and wants to work with you. So mm -hmm. I don't think you need to wait around and and deal with deal with that kind of stuff. I think it's helpful to try to reverse engineer what it would be like to be a rep or an agent. Mm -hmm. And idea. if you do that and you think, okay, here I am. I'm I'm advertising. I've got you know. Let's say you take. Shannon Associates as an example, and they've got over 100 illustrators, maybe over 200. They've got a lot. And let's say they have this stable of artists and what their goal is, 
is to basically field all the balls that are flying out to the outfield, right? So all the jobs that are coming, they're trying to find an artist that can catch those jobs, mm-hmm. right? And, and, and to me, they're, because it, it used to be that agents or reps had, you know, 10 or 15 artists. Now with the internet, you've got Shannon Associates, if, let's say they've got a couple hundred. Well, what they're trying to do is, it, rather than getting the most high quality jobs, and keeping 10 artists really busy all the time and managing their careers. What their goal is, is just to not lose any jobs. So they get a percentage of every single job that comes in. Do they care about the, let's say they've got their 200, they know where they rank. So there's the top 100, there's the top 50. Mm-hmm. And those top 50, and, I've, and this is the kind of a dirty little secret that I've been privy to. I've been told this directly, there's the top 50 <laughs> that they are basically trying to keep busy all the time because they're their best illustrators. And then there's the 50 to 100 that are, they're keeping busy most of the time. And then there's everybody else that they have decided to represent simply to not lose those jobs that when they offer them to the top 100, they get turned down because those guys are already busy. Mm -hmm. So then they, they, those artists turn the rep down and say, I can't do that work. So then they, they are like, well, what about so-and-so? We could, we could shift you over to this artist and hoping that the client says yes, and then they still get a percentage of that job. But meanwhile, that person that's in like 150 to 200 on the bottom of the totem pole is just getting a job every now and then and not enough to sustain them. And so they're like, well, at least I'm glad that I got that job here and there, but why am I not getting more work? Well, it's because it's going to their top artists most of the time mm-hmm. it makes sense as a as a business model i mean yeah, they don't want they don't want to have just a, once once their stable filled up if they did do that model where it's 15 illustrators once they're full they would have no more income right and so, so i've got i've got a friend and i'm not going to name names i've got a friend who is one of their top 50 probably one of their top 10 who is busy all the time who has to turn down work all the time and who makes a really good living as an illustrator. And if you were to ask him, hey, what do you think of Shannon Associates? He's gonna say they're, they're amazing, they're awesome. But then you talk to someone who's just signed up, you know, maybe they've been with them for a year or two and they're hardly getting any work and they're like, they suck, you know? And so that's, but that's the reason is where you fit on that, on that um, totem pole of, right. Of talent, you know, is, like anything, it's probably like a bell-shaped curve, right? Of of job distribution and yeah. income and and hiring frequency and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So um, that's goes back to what you guys, one of you were saying. I can't remember who was saying. Um, if you aren't ready, it's probably better that you don't have a rep. And that's because if you're coming in in the bottom segment of those artists it's going to build you up emotionally. I just got a rep, but it's pretty much meaningless because you're not going to get any work because you're not competing with the, the top level of those. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, I think it can actually hinder it too, because if you're on your own in that, in that early stage where you're not getting work, like Will was saying, he was sending out postcards and I was hyper aggressive about my advertising strategy. I was all in uh, matter of fact, I took out a business loan just to buy all the postcards and the postage and the ad base. So I got the names and all that stuff. And I was sending them for the first year uh, to uh, one postcard every two months mm-hmm. was my strategy. So I, I got comfortable with knowing how this feels to be advertising. Like Will said, you got to kind of put yourself in the rep's shoes. So I got a, I got a taste of that. I mailed out custom sample mailers to the, my dream clients and, and I did all that stuff. And so, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's helpful to, to be your own advocate because you can say, Hey, this is what's going to, this is what the agent's going to do for me. This is how I'm going to look from that side. So it's, I think it's good to try it yourself and make sure, just make sure you're ready. Cause if you sign up, like Will said, and all of a sudden you're two years dormant and they're not really advertising you, you're at the bottom of their queue. You're just sort of dormant there. Yeah. And that's actually what you just described is, is the advice that I've heard over and over again is the best thing you can do is when you're starting out, market yourself, go through everything, trying to get work on your own. And then you can see if you're, if you are getting work regularly, well, maybe you don't need a rep. And if you do sign up with a rep and you stop getting work because it's an exclusive contract, then you'll realize, crap, I was doing a better job than the rep. 
if you get, obviously, if you get really good jobs and better jobs and more of the jobs that you want through the rep, then it's all roses. But at least you'll have something to compare it to. You can also appreciate what the rep is doing um, if you are getting work through them and you weren't able to get it on your own, but you were trying. Um, so... It's an interesting, interesting time, I think. I mean, now, now that the, like you were saying, the, inter, the interwebs has changed the game over the past 15, 20 years, I'd be a big advocate if you're sitting there in your studio and you're like, oh, should I get a rep? Here's what I would do, my advice. I don't even know if I should say this. I'm just kind of talking off the top of my head, <laughs> <laughs> i.e. didn't plan well. <laughs> I would get a group of like eight people together. If you can, the power of a group of people is so strong. Mm -hmm. um, so put together some custom mailers with this group of people. You guys buy a mailing list for the group of people. You, you're basically sharing costs, especially if you're local to a city. Like if you have a group of people you graduated with, if you're in school or just a group of friends that you're online with, whatever. But the power of a group of people is, is strong in my opinion, maybe a group website, maybe a group studio. And you kind of act as, as, as just a way to, to limit risk. If you're doing something by yourself, things are expensive. Postage is expensive. But you have a group of four people on a postcard that hopefully don't have too much of a competing style. That's a great way to save costs and to pool together uh, an amount of resources. And I don't know, it might, might even be a better way to go than an agent because then when each of you gets jobs, you get a hundred percent of it, not, not mm -hmm. 70. Mm -hmm. That's what that's I, if I was starting out now, that's. A, Just make a little, like a, a collective or something. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly I like that right. idea. Why don't we do that? <laughs> yeah, let's fire all right. Well, it's funny because I just signed on to a studio downtown and that's, that's sort of what I was thinking about when I was there. I was like, oh my God, this is, this is 10 pros all in the same room, all repped, giving each person giving between 15 and 30% to an agent. I was like, man, the power in this room, we all, A, we already all know everybody within publishing mm -hmm. if you went down on each of our lists. Um, and then, you know, we're already known enough in these publishing houses that I don't know, it would, it would be such a strong move. I shouldn't say this out loud. Cut the, we need to edit this. <laughs> I'm not thinking of all even my agent, but I just thought when I was sitting there like, God, the power in this room is, is, is strong. And like Will was saying, or, or I can't remember which one you're saying, but like, yeah, you used to have to live in that city and know all the publishers and all that stuff. And you don't need that anymore. I think it's different now. Um, you know, the power of a group to hold a, we were, I was, the reason I was thinking of it is a collective group of people renting a building for a weekend and having their own gallery show where everybody's just responsible for their portion of the wall. And then all the artists keep their own work. It would be, you know, 200 bucks instead of paying a gallery 50% and then they curate the work. You got to wait a year to show your work. If the power of a group of people did that. They would all be able to show their work anytime in any space. No, you forget one thing. Artists are dumber than ball players. <laughs> We're just not business minded, most of us, you know. It's true. So you just need one person like us three that's crazy. That's like, hey, let's all do this thing. Each of you give me 200 bucks and we'll just let the chips fall where they may. Everybody puts their work in. But I don't know. That's, it. that's my advice because there's no risk to it. There's no, yeah. you're not signed onto a contract. You're not losing a big, big percentage and you can get your feet wet. And then if you decide to go the agent route later, you can. Yeah. Hey, for sake of time, let me, let me go through some, some pros and cons of having a rep. And then I want to talk contracts real quick. And then I want to get to Joel's question. Does that sound Sounds good? good. Okay. Good. So pros. And if you guys want to chime in and just, you've got to like anecdote one of these, just, just chime in here. But I have written down, um, you know, the pros of having an, an, an agent or a rep is that they will spend time and money marketing your work. They'll expose you to their clients, the clients that, you might not be able to um, either break into or find or know about or whatever. Um, they should be able to command more money per job. So even though you're paying them a percentage, the amount of money that they're able to negotiate should be, and isn't always, but should be more than what you would negotiate on your own. Mm -hmm. um, they are the ones that are going to be tasked with collecting money. And so uh, you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, calling up a client that's paying late or that's not paying at all or whatever and hunting down your money. Um, and then they should be clarifying assignments for you. So they should be, you know, working with the, with the client and getting all the job details, understanding that job and, and regurgitating it to you in a way that uh, is more easily packaged, more easily understood, stuff like that. Am I missing any pros? 
I, I think that's I think that's good. I should add one side of that. You said it's, they're good for collecting money when it's due. Mm -hmm. I think the best part of having an agent is when they're negotiating what you're actually going to be paid. That can be a really awkward thing. And if you're going to dig in and say, no, I need this much to illustrate this story. And the publisher's like, no, we don't have that. And you're like, fine, well, I'm not doing it. You know, I mean, you can see how if you're trying to do that conversation on your own, then you finally get the job. I'm like, okay, let's start work after you just beat each other up for a couple right. of weeks. It's super awkward. That's a good point. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. So put the, uh, how would you say that? You, the, um, they do the, they are in the trenches for you. So that yeah, you're not good, getting good cop, bad cop. You're the good yeah. cop. You're just there to work, but they're there to negotiate. Yeah. So the cons list I have is, is a little bit longer. Um, well, can I add one more thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing Go to ahead. That too? They just have a broader um, understanding of, of like the industry as a whole. So, you know, I, I had an agent that um, the agent I currently have. She was able to, um, she understood like where things were going as far as digital downloads and digital comics and things like that. And, and, the publisher, she knew the publishing industry was also kind of slow to react. And so she was able to secure those rights for me with my Missile Mouse books. And, um, and then when digital comics, digital downloads started to become a thing, um, you know, that was a bargaining chip that, that we had to, um, you know, to work, to work on future, future deals. Otherwise, if that was included in the contract early on, um, you know, that would have just been like now, you know, something that I, that I wouldn't have been able to, um, you know, added to a deal later on. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so it was just, it was just kind of this cool thing where I was like really grateful that she knew what to ask for and what, what to like bargain with and, and what to work with that I had no idea, you know, I, I didn't understand and um, and so that's just another like just just their their knowledge and their understanding of of if you have a good one of um, you know trajectories and and futures of 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 the of the business and the industry how it's how it's moving. Cool. I'd like to add one more pro. This one's way more superficial than that. <laughs> it's just like how cool it is to say my agent. You guys remember that when you first got <laughs> But it adds a sense of being legitimate in a way that you can't get otherwise. And like the comparison that I'll do, like, you know, I live in Nashville now, so I meet a lot of, there's a lot of musicians around and something. But the second a musician, anybody can say they're a musician, right? But the second I'm talking to somebody and they say my record label, mm -hmm. okay, now I know that there's a difference here. You know, they're, they're perceived completely differently by me. Um, and I just want to hang out with them because they're cooler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's actually I, actually a, a good way to get out of doing something too. So you guys know you're an illustrator. You're gonna meet somebody at church or something, and they'll be like, "Oh, my grandma has a story <laughs> that she needs to have illustrated." Uh, you know, you'd be perfect for it. They haven't seen your work. They don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah. They don't know what style you do, but you're perfect for it. All you have to say is that. Wow, that sounds you know that's that sounds really interesting. Um, have your grandma contact my agent, and then we can work <laughs> something up. And and then they realize, oh, okay. It's <laughs> a good point. Perfect. That is a good one for the pros list, um, even though it is somewhat superficially. <laughs> that's, totally. right, that's how I roll. <laughs> okay, cons. They don't market your work, right? So you could have an, a, a rep that isn't doing anything for you, and so. You think they're working for you, so you relax, and then they're not doing anything. Um, they don't expose you to clients, you know, so you're not getting the benefit of, of thinking that you're going to get, you know, uh, access to their list. Um, another con is that you, this is kind of redundant, but you don't know what's happening. So you lose, you know, with, with, when you sign up with a, with a rep, you kind of lose a snapshot of what's actually going on in the prospecting for your work, you know, so you, you become out of touch and you're sitting there twiddling your thumbs. And with some, we can maybe inter interject contracts in here. Some reps will send you a contract that states that every job you do, whether you find it on your own or whether they find it has to go through them. And so you are basically signing away your right to prospect for clients, you know, 
you're and and that's quite a bit of power and autonomy to give away mm-hmm. um you know for you know so and if they're not doing anything you've basically just set your career on a shelf and right. you might not have even known it um another one is that uh you're not developing your own database of clients and so like jake and you know, i know that you like you have this amazing database of of um potential art buyers and customers and clients and things like that. What would you, where would you be without that list? Um, I don't know what you're talking about. What? <laughs> Got no list. <laughs> I, I well, list. You're, and maybe your list is more, um, you know, personal art buyers, you know, people that have bought stuff from you. You, you know, actually, now that you think about it, like if, uh, if, yeah, if I was really, you know, looking at the schedule and realizing, Oh, I need work for the next few months. I could go back to everybody that I've worked with in the past and just say, Hey, I'm available. I know, uh, you've contacted me before and I, and my availability has been, been bad, but, um, but I'm available now and I'm sure one or two jobs could come from, come from that. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, in a sense, but as far as like a, an actual like list of people that I can hit up for money, <laughs> you know, okay. whatever you're in, a, you're, in a, you're an anomaly in that you 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 get work through your agent and you get work from all different places and stuff, and so you really haven't had to prospect like most normal people. I, I used to keep lists. I don't keep lists anymore. Um, yeah. But I think you're right, Will. I think I think any artist at this point sort of has diversified enough to where if my publishing ran dry, I could not easily, but fairly easily just switch gears and, and replace that income in another avenue of, within my circle of income, I guess. So you could Jake. So, yeah, all of us do. Yeah. Well, when, and you're I keep those out, when, when you're starting out and we're, you know, on our, I think we're gearing this our podcast to people that are a lot of them are coming out of school or coming off of another career and trying to break into illustration. They don't have a client list at all. They don't have a track record of working with clients. They're trying to develop that in the beginning. And if you go straight to a rep, you don't develop those kinds of connections where, you know, I had in the beginning, I had, you know, a few hundred people that I had worked with after a few years you know, after, well, maybe three or four years, and I could mail to those clients and say, you know, send them some of my new work, and it would almost always generate more work from them, people that I worked with in the past. If you don't have that, and you give that up to your rep, and they're not getting you work, you, you there's not much you can do, you know, so that's, to me, that's a con. Um, mm-hmm. Paying the money, paying, you know, 25, 10 to 35% of your money is kind of a, the downside, um, getting the same prices that you would charge. So a bad case scenario would be, you know, you're up for a children's book and they're going to offer, you know, $15,000 to do this picture book or $20,000 or something. And your, your rep gets the same money because you know, they can't negotiate higher than you would have. And now you're giving up, you know, that percentage to your rep and the rep isn't really doing much and you would have gotten that job anyway. Or, you know, like especially the scenario of, let's say you have signed a deal where everything has to go through your rep and the publisher, and this has happened to me, publisher contacts you directly. We've got $15,000. Do you want to do it? Yes, I do. But I need you to contact my agent. And, and if you were going to do that, by the way, I would handhold that. I wouldn't hang up and let them or, you know, just send them an email and say, go ahead and contact my agent. I would call, I would introduce them. <clears throat> I would reply to their email and to my agent and hand them off physically, mm-hmm. not leave it up to chance. Like, well, they'll contact my agent and then the agent right. will contact me. I just do a reply all or, or right. I, you know, do the reply and then add my, my agent in there in the BCC field mm-hmm. um, or the CC field. Uh, one thing I should add, that's a interesting point. And a lot of people who haven't had a rep may think, well, why should I, and I'd like to get you guys opinion on this. Why should I give, any money to the agent when somebody came to me directly. And so right. my take on that side of things is once I sign with an agent, we've agreed to be partners and whether mm-hmm. that doesn't matter, it's all encompassing because my, my thinking is my agent's getting my work out there. Ideally, that's what should be happening. Who knows where 
these publishers saw the work. And so mm -hmm. it could indirectly be due to the advertising effort of the agent. You can't guarantee that it's not. And if you start taking jobs on the side, it can get, it could get nasty so quick. Yeah. Um, so I just say we're partners and that's this, what it is. Yeah. Have this mindset. You want to win the championship. You're not, you're not really worried about the game, the, this game that you're playing right now. It's, it's all about, you know, winning winning the championship and and you can't win the championship if you have like bad practices game to game right mm -hmm. um and so yeah you might make a little more money on this particular one but at what cost and right. and uh right. you're go you're only going to win the championship by partnering up and and working you know hand in hand with with an agent however i have to disagree with you guys <laughs> I, you're, you're absolutely right. If you have, if you have a, um, an agent or a rep that you have a really good relationship with and the work is flowing. And I had this with, with Shannon associates before our, our meltdown, but I would turn stuff over. I, I turn stuff over to them regularly. The, the rep that I have right now, I don't have that, um, that deal in place. It's basically, if you want to bring me work, I'll do that work. If, if it, if it fits in my schedule, if it's the right amount of money, if it's the right job, but I'm gonna, I can find stuff on my own too, and I'm not gonna share it with you. And that's just the way that I prefer to work with them um, uh, for, for reasons without, you know, totally getting into everything. That I didn't even know me. that was an op optional. It's good to talk about this. I didn't even know you could work that deal. Yeah, uh, and, and yeah. So anyway, um, but that is a downside if, if they're getting the same price. Uh, another one would be waiting for your money. So you keep in mind if, if, if the, uh, the client is on a net 30 payment schedule, you might, you, know, you don't get the, the, the invoice to them right away. So it takes a couple of weeks by the time your agent or your rep gets um, the check with mail times included, it could be six weeks to two months. And then they have to deposit that in their bank account they have to do their accounting and then maybe the next week or two, maybe they're on a, a bi-week, bi-monthly schedule to send checks out or something. So there's another couple of weeks before the check gets sent out to you. And then there's another week in it getting actually getting to you. And so you could be adding an extra month to getting paid and sometimes longer. And there are horror stories that we don't have time to talk about there. We're uh, really going to push back on them. that one really quick. If, if you've got your agent should be putting in the contract, contract that they'll be paid separately right so i've i get all my checks straight from the publisher with and and my agent gets her checks straight from the publisher and they're already like divided like i've never had that i've situation. never had that jake see jake what he, he the thing is that he's got these guys that carry him around on the, <laughs> the you know the little chair up in the air and stuff you know I should add, what I mean, it's a great about? point to bring up that when you sign with an agent, it's the same kind of contract negotiations as you would have with a publisher. So everything's not set in stone. What Jake's talking about could probably be negotiated if you know about it. With my current publisher, they're, they're an agent. They're an illustrator agent. They're not a literary agent, but I negotiated a different rate because I was coming from a literary agent. Why would I go from a 15% deal to a 30% deal? I'm not doing that. So... Mm -hmm. You can have these, everything's not set in stone is that this is the only way things work. Ask for what you want or what you need um, and, uh, and go from there. Yeah. Cool. Last, last one on my list is the, that your agent could actually pass your work to another artist. And so there are situations where uh, they've got another artist that they're trying to make happy that's kind of a squeaky wheel begging for work and stuff. And the, the client might ask for you, but maybe you've already got some work. And so rather than load you up with even more that, work that you really want the agent or rep can you don't know who what they're what the phone call is going you know how it's going on the other end and they might divert your work over and i know some people that that's happened to where they found out later that the client said well you well your agent said you were busy and they weren't they never told their agent they were busy so oh that's no that's no good but that, yeah, I mean, so, wouldn't, wouldn't that be a pro and a con because the, the reverse would probably be true as well if somebody else is busy then something would trickle over to you yeah that's a good point um, so yeah, so that, that's kind of the list of, of pros and cons. I, the last thing I really wanted to talk about before we hit Joel's letter is, um, the, the con contractually, my advice, and I'd love to get your guys' take as well, is when, when you, when a rep wants to work with you, it's, it's like they're asking you out on a date, right? 
So it's like mm-hmm. they're saying, I, I love what you do. I think I can make money off of what you do. I think you're great. I want to go out with you. Now here's a contract that will protect me from you. It doesn't work both ways. The, the contract they send you does not protect you. It only protects them from you. The only stuff that's written in that contract is to screw you over when things go wrong. And (laughs) it really is. If you think about it, right? There's nothing in there that works in your favor. I don't agree with that. I I always think of a contract as being just a written set of terms so everybody knows what, how this thing is going to work. Um, Mm -hmm. If it is just benefiting one person, then obviously you need, or one side, you need to, redo some things in there but i i always view contracts whether it's for with a publisher or, or a agent or with a friend or anybody as being hey here's what i think is, is this my is this what your understanding is because this is my understanding and it, then when everybody signs it they say okay this is the understanding that we all have this is a great place to disagree because i would challenge you to look at your contract and see where you have your hooks in them versus where they have their hooks in you if things go south I would argue that they can do more damage to you than you can to them. Give give me an example of something going south. Okay. So if, if for some reason, like most contracts say something to this uh, effect that if you decide as the artist to part ways for any reason, you decide, Hey, you know what? It's not working out, blah, blah, blah. Most of them have something written in there that you have to stay repped represented by them for six months plus one month for every year you were together. So if you were together for three years, you'd have to stay with them for nine months after you said that you didn't want to work with them. I actually know two people who fell under this clause and contractually were not allowed to prospect for work until that time was up and had to still send any jobs they found or that came to them through the rep. And at that point, the rep has the incentive to divert all your work to their other artists because they know that you're you're going to be ending. And I, I know an artist who was financially ruined for a few years in trying to honor that agreement. I haven't seen that agreement. I have seen a smaller period, like a three month window of non-compete, which makes sense. If they just sent out, you know, two years worth of advertisements with you and then all of a sudden you got popular and then you bail, it's, that's to, that is to protect that moment where you're like, use, use them to build your brand and then you just bail. So you get all the money. They have to be protected against that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think too, like with anything, you need to probably bring your own lawyer into the situation um, just just to have them review the contract. Uh, and and it might cost five hundred bucks, but um, you know, in a situation like this, you, you're going to want to wish you had spent that five hundred bucks, you know, three years ago, right? I think that's very smart and yeah. nice. I think so too. Okay, let me let me hit uh, Joel's question. I totally disagree with you guys, but I'm not prepared because I, I I need a contract in front of you, but I would have more examples to prove you wrong. Maybe we'll do it on another mm-hmm. one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but I'm gonna for the sake of time, I'm gonna jump over here to Joel's letter. So he says uh, he will hope all is well, man. I wanted to ask you a question. I'll try to be as brief as possible. I recently got a contract to work with an artist rep. And it's cool because they have several reps around the world and they all email me with different client opportunities, AKA jobs. Depending on my workload, I say yes. However, sometimes by the time a rep gets back and says yes, the client is good with the proposal and wants to move forward, I might have already said yes to one of their other reps and started working on another project. So this is one of those, this is a great problem to have. Um, He says, I find myself being double booked. I don't want to turn away projects while I'm waiting to see if another project gets approved. So he kind of has to take the the one that's being offered at the time. Um, So basically he's asking and he goes on to say, what would your suggestions be um, to figure out how it works? Um, What what would you guys say? I I missed that. How is he double booked? So in the time that it takes for, you know, because the rep contacts you and says, are you available? during these dates to do a job and you might say yes. And then that client goes, or the agent goes back to the client and, and is communicating, yes, this illustrator can do it during that time. And then the client doesn't respond right away. 
and then they might burn a week or two and, and they're having their meetings and everything going, hey, this artist says he can do it or she can do it. And so are we good with that? And they have their meeting and then everyone in the sitting around the table goes, yes, let's go ahead and hire that artist. And two weeks has gone by. And in that time, another client has slipped in there and said, and really fast and said, yeah, we want to get going. So now he's taken on a big project that he's already started on. And now this other one comes back and says, we're ready to go. And now he's like killing himself with too much work. <laughs> Man, I, I mean, I don't know if that's a rep problem. I think that's just a freelance problem. And I say first come, first serve and and, and being super upfront has been the biggest thing mm -hmm. I've learned. Uh, instead of saying, oh man, now I got to do both of these, but I don't have time. And so I'm going to try to do both, even though it's probably going to flop a little bit. Mm -hmm. I just say, hey, sorry, but this, uh, you know, I agreed to this other job. And then I propose what I can do. Can we move it back to this date? Or can, can we, you know, just give some kind of way to work it but just being up front saying hey, if you want it right now somebody else is in that spot and i'm gonna have to decline it you can't just take everything over and overlap it should he mm -hmm. worry about his agent because this is this is an keep in mind this is an agent that has reps around the world and it's all the same company and he's worried about damaging a relationship with one of those reps because he's turning one down and saying yes to another but it, are they different reps how are they overlapping i don't know understand. they work for the same company they're a conglomerate. Oh, it well, maybe, hmm. maybe it maybe when this, when the second one contacts him, like he's already in the, in the, in the running for the first job, second rep contacts and say, Hey, do you want to do this job? Say, Hey, I'm interested, but know that I've already got something in the works with this person. Can you contact him and make sure it's cool? I don't know. Maybe that's yeah. have them have them contact each other within the company. Maybe is that what your suggestion is? Yeah. Just say I'm up for this. I mean, I always think just being straightforward and upfront is the easy one. So, Hey, I'm in the running for this job. I don't know if it's going to happen or not. How would that work? Here's the contact mm. <laughs> call. <laughs> yep. Lee's right. You, you just, I mean, just be honest and, and, and upfront with everything. Uh, like you said, and, and it's, it's their problem. It's not, it's not your problem. The other thing is, is you could say, I mean, you could use that also as a, like a negotiating thing too. Like, hey, because you guys took so long, I had to take on another job um, and I could take on this one, but I'm going to have to work weekends to do it. So it's going to cost this much, this much extra, you know, and if yeah. that's, that's how you guys want to do it, that's how we're going to do it. And nobody's going to get mad at that. I always think of like analogy situations. Like if I, if I wanted new cabinets for my kitchen and I'm, waffling over the weekend on this design after I've already contacted a cabinet maker. And then I go back on Monday saying, okay, we figured out our cabinets, but somebody else has already came in over the weekend and ordered their whole kitchen. I'm not going to expect them to push them out of the way. You know what I mean? Right. Like now, now I've I dragged my feet and now I got to deal with it. So same thing. Mm -hmm. I like it. All right. That's done with this one? basically it. Unless you guys have anything else you want to add, but I really enjoyed talking about this because I think it's something that uh, that's on a lot of artists minds and especially artists that are kind of starting out and there really isn't a good I mean you really have to get advice from different artists to know kind of how to handle this situation for sure yeah yeah no, I think I don't have anything to add to this so unless you do Lee think, think about I, I you know going it alone is hard going it with a rep is hard the collective idea is what I recommend. I'm going to leave with that. <laughs> it's a no, no loose win, win. You're like uh, join a commune and <laughs> the illustration commune and start growing plants uh, what, on the roof or something. You start growing vegetables on the roof and, making honey and <laughs> I think we, I think <laughs> us three should somehow get a percentage of everybody's job. How can we make that? Could we do that? 0.34% of every illustration <laughs> job. <laughs> okay, I'm, we're done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Three Point Perspective is made possible by svslearn.com, where becoming a great illustrator starts. And your hosts have been Will Terry. That was his topic today. He was running the show. Thanks, Will, for that. Uh, you can find him at willterry.com or contact him on Instagram at willterryart. We have Lee White. And his website is leewhiteillustration.com. And you can contact him or find his stuff at leewhiteillo on, uh, on Instagram. And I'm Jake Parker. My website's mrjakeparker.com. And my Instagram account is at jakeparker. 
Uh, podcast is edited by Alex Sugg. That's Sugg with two G's. And you can uh, contact him or find his work at alexsugg.com. And the podcast is produced by Tanner Garlic. And that is uh, Tanner Garlic Art for his website, tannergarlicart.com for his website. Uh, special thanks to Aaron Painter, who got uh, our website up, or not our website, our podcast up on YouTube. And you can find his work at painterdraws.com. And I believe that's also his, um, his Instagram account as well, at painterdraws. Let me just t- double check to make sure I don't want to... <laughs> I don't want to uh, send them all off. somewhere else like you did yep, with no. my mailer. <laughs> it's at Painter Draws. It's not at Aaron Painter. I I, uh, I did that wrong one time. Okay, so moving on, moving on, moving on. <laughs> if you like this episode, please share it around. Subscribe to it on iTunes or whatever you like to listen to your podcast on. And um, I like the podcast app on my iPhone. It's it's actually really really easy way to listen to podcasts. Uh, but go ahead and leave a review if you can. We like, like we said today, we, we read them, we love them. Uh, we love the feedback and we like to know how we could improve or how you're wrong and we're, and we're right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this discussion, if you want to join in on this, talk about agents, reps, um, we have a thread going on the svslearn.com forum and we've, we've, uh, we, we're talking about it there. You can just log on to that forum. They're free to join. It's a great community. It's a nice, warm community for, for artists. Uh, so come on, pipe in. We'd love to know what you, uh, what you think um, about this subject. And that's it. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. 